Thank you, Rich, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, uh, I'm humbled, especially uh, seeing some of the people that I have known for years and looked up to, so I am, I am definitely humbled to be uh, speaking with all of you. Um, a couple of caveats before jumping in. Um, first, uh, the, the subject of the talk is unconscious, but this will not really be a religious talk. I want to keep it practical as much as possible. Um, but having said that, having conscience and talking about conscience, you can't help but uh, veer into the spiritual realm, conscience being a part of our soul. Uh, but I'll try to avoid the errors of being overly general and overly specific. I think there could be actually more difficulty with the latter when we try to be overly specific, right? There's no blue book, blue book or blueprint for uh, parenting, and there's no blueprint for you know, forming the conscience of our sons. So I'll, tr I'll try to give some general principles, but also some concrete takeaways that we can all hopefully take home. Um, this says, the, the title says, Forming the Consciences of Our Young Sons, uh, but really that's just because we're at the heights. Uh, everything that I'm going to say is really going to apply to our daughters as well. Um, and young, I, as Rich said, is, I'm head of the lower school, so those ages are 8, 9, 10, thereabouts. Um, but as you will hear in a, in a few minutes, we'll get into sort of the, the ages and how that applies. Um, finally, uh, just to, to get it out there that I am not an expert in parenting. Um, I'm not sure there is such a thing. Uh, but uh, as we go about it, usually the ones who are quickest to remind us that we are not experts are our own children. Uh, I'm reminded of a time when my wife and I were talking in the kitchen and, and my, one of my children was playing down the basement just next to the, to the kitchen and we could hear him kind of lost in his own world of imaginative play. And he was actually playing with this Noah's Ark set. And here we are in the kitchen thinking, gosh, well, we've done such a good job. <laughs> you know, here was our son playing with toy, kind of imaginatively, creatively, and with Noah's Ark set, no less, you know, a little cherub. And he's down there and he's saying, okay, lion, get in the ark. Good boy, lion. A cow, get in the ark. Good boy, cow. And my wife and I are just kind of listening and saying, zebra, get in the ark. Zebra, zebra, I'm going to count to three. <laughs> and then he says, zebra, get in the damn ark and put your seatbelt on. <laughs> and um, so, so you are not listening to an expert in parenting tonight. What I am bringing and hoping to bring to the table tonight is experience. Uh, both the experience of the collective wisdom that has come down through the years, through these 50 years at the Heights, that I am one of the beneficiaries of uh, by virtue of, of having taught there um, and having gone to school there as well. And also the experience of having watched these boys, you know, hundreds and hundreds of boys over the time that I've been there, and, and, and witnessing how they grow in conscience witnessing how great parents and good parents and struggling parents like all of us are helping their sons grow in conscience and how the teachers do what, what, what has helped and what has not been helpful. And that's what I'll try to bring to the table tonight. And basically, what I'm going to give and share with you is really the program that we try to execute at the Heights um, as teachers and as faculty with, with our sons, with our students um, in, this, in this realm. Okay, so as Rich said, I am a soccer coach as well, so you think that this talk is, is for you, but I really have been using it as a way to just kind of think about how I can get more out of my players. Um, so if you don't mind bearing with me, I'm going to just run through some plays with you real quick. Uh, this is a half of a soccer field, um, no artist. Here's our defense. We have a Standard flat back four. Um, there's a striker, an opposing striker there. Here's a, we'll call him a defensive midfielder right here. And the ball comes from the opponent's midfield 
and it makes its way right here. So this guy's got the ball, right? And we're defending. They're attacking this goal here. Now, what I'm interested in in this scenario is this player. Okay, the defensive midfielder. This guy's got a clear uh, project. He's got to defend. He's got to not let this guy buy him. This guy's got a lot of options. This player could have hundreds of different directions he could run in. He could make a choice to go anywhere in the field. But it really boils down to just a couple, right? He can, you know, if, let's say he was marking his guy there. He can stay there and mark that guy. He can um, double down and kind of pinch down and, and play defense on top of him. He can come here and kind of provide cover for this player. He can fan out and, and hope to start a counterattack and get a ball real quickly. That's, that's the scenario, and that's the player that I'm interested in this, in this uh, play right here. Because the bigger question is, for me as a coach, not necessarily what the right choice is, but as a coach, how do I get my players to make the right decisions in a scenario like this? Because um, soccer presents us with tons and tons of different decisions that we have to make. And it boils down to, regardless of how much technique you have, if you don't make the right decision, it doesn't matter. It's worthless. So you can talk and talk and talk about virtue, but if you don't see, if you don't recognize what the right move is in a given situation, then it's all for naught. Um, let's bring this into the, the, the perspective of what we want to talk about today. St. Thomas Aquinas, and by the way, we're going to be standing on the shoulders of many giants here, namely St. Thomas Aquinas, but, but also a few others. And St. Thomas is the one who's done a, given us so much study and writing on this. He defines conscience as the act of applying moral knowledge to a particular act. Okay? So we can kind of transpose this and, and, and maybe imagine a, a hypothetical scenario f for one of our sons who, let's say, is um, playing at a friend's house. And the friend mentions to him, hey, my mom's going to be going out pretty soon. We're going to be here by ourselves. I got this R-rated movie. What do you say? Right? Not apples to apples, but again, he could do lots of different things in this moment. And what we as parents want to be thinking about is how do we raise our sons, not just in that one moment, but in all moments like this, where he has a moral decision to make, what the right move is, and not only what the right move is, but how to go about making that move. He's got to respond to that moral situation, and he's got to respond in the right way. So what's at play here? St. Thomas is telling us that if we need moral knowledge, then what he's talking about are general principles, general universal principles that apply to the moral universe. And this is natural law. And, you know, I have to, I have to cover this with my, my juniors when I teach them who are budding moral relativists, um, that there is such a thing as objective truth. That's not going to be the, the purpose of this talk tonight, but um, we have to, as parents, as human beings, understand that there is a universal goodness, a universal truth. There is right and there is wrong. And there is an ultimate truth, capital T, and goodness, capital G, which is God. We do what we do, not because it's right or it's because it's wrong, because we want to be happy. And perfect happiness does not exist in this life. And so happiness exists in the next life, in our union with God. And so everything we do... We have to have that end in, in sight. If we don't accept that, then a, a conversation about conscience is, it makes no sense. There's that great scene from a little interaction from Alice in Wonderland where Alice is talking with the Cheshire cat. And she's saying, would you mind telling me which way I should go? And the Cheshire cat says, well, it depends on where you would like to end up. And Alice says, well, I don't really care much where. And he says, well, then it doesn't really matter which way you go. If we don't believe that there is objective truth and that we are going to try to shoot to get to that union with God, which we believe is our ultimate happiness, then, then conscience doesn't really make much sense. So that's a starting point, is the moral knowledge. Secondly, 
we have to apply that moral knowledge to a particular act. And this is where it gets complicated. Because the particulars are innumerable. I mean, we just did this on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on a soccer play. Um, in the game of chess, after the third move, uh, I'm just going to do this quick math in my head, but I think it's um, uh, four million possible situations on the board. Four million possible positions on the board. After the fourth move, or I think after the fifth move, you're in the billions of possible board positions. Right? That's just a board with you know, 32 pieces on it. Imagine a soccer game. How many more you know, options there are. Now think about the moral life of our sons. The particulars are infinite. The possible scenarios that they could find themselves in are infinite. So that's the simplicity of it, is we have this natural law that God has given us that is universal. It is, it is there and it is objective. But the complexity of it is that the variety is so vast. OK, so the conscience, then, is the combination. It's the ability to have knowledge of that universal St. Thomas calls synderesis, a knowledge of the natural law, and prudence, the virtue of prudence, which is the ability to apply it to the particulars of our life. So that's our goal. That's what we're shooting at. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. When does this education begin? Well, um, before answering that, let's just think about for a second how we operate just as human beings at a young age. As soon as we're born, our intellect's not, you know, really fully there or there at all, really. Our intelligence grows incrementally. Um, but our desires are there. We know what we want from day one, right? And that's a good thing because it allows us to, to communicate as best we can or at least to demonstrate that we need to eat, we need to drink, we need to go to sleep, we're tired. So that's a good thing. But as we know as parents that those desires can often be wrong. They can often be off. And if you need any demonstration, you can come to my house and witness my one-year-old go around and put everything in his mouth that is uh, less than a, a golf ball size. Um, we're wrong about that. So as parents, we need to step in and we need to, we need to show even the youngest humans that we have under our care what is good and what is not good, what is safe, what is dangerous. Um, and so we're helping them distinguish that from the get-go, the good from the bad. Um, we have, you know, our, you know, we take them for a walk and we say, you know, this is, this is a sidewalk. You can walk on the sidewalk. That's good. This is a street. Looks just like a sidewalk. I know, but that's bad. Okay. Just understand there's a little bit of grass in between. That's why you know, that's the line. We're differentiating for them. Uh, the difference between me. And they like this. They get a kick out of it. My, my, one of my young, young ones who's just beginning to verbalize his, his thoughts, um, every time he goes, walks past a trash can, he goes, <laughs> because that was our way of communicating to him that that is gross. And he loves just understanding that that's, okay, that is bad, that is gross, and that's his way of labeling it. So they get a kick out of this. They want us to, to distinguish them for us. We also need to help them with measure. There are good things, but good things up to a point. And past that point, it becomes no longer a good thing, right? Um, you can have a good food that's healthy. Too much of it is not going to be good for you. And also order. The order, there are goods, but this good is better than this good, right? Um, yeah, we know you want to play, and play is good. We know you want to cuddle with dad, and that's good, too. But you really need to sleep, and that's the best <laughs> for dad, but also for you, because your body needs it, and your mind needs it, right? And so we help them understand the order of goods as well. So when does, does moral education start? Day one. It starts day one, not in the, in the way that we're actually educating their, their conscience just yet, but we're setting them up. We're doing the ground prep for when their intellect does kick in. 
Because if we, if they're not used to hearing no, if they're not used to understanding that at this line, it's no longer good, or that this good is better than this good, then they become, um, you know, this is the, the spoiled child. And the spoiled child is not just an, an annoying kid. He's someone who is not going to be well prepared for conscience formation at all. Joseph Pieper is a 20th century German philosopher, and he makes the case that one of the biggest enemies to prudence is covetousness. And the way he defines covetousness is being too attached to any good. And being attached in, a, in an extreme way. It's having this desperate uh, desire or anxiety for self-preservation. And that's what happens when we have a, a spoiled child. And they're unable to see the reality of, of what, they, what they need and what is good. And then they hit the age of reason, and then their intellect kicks in, and when this is, who knows, we've said it's around seven. Um, you know, we gotta believe it's different for, for different kids. But now our intellect gets, starts to do the work that our parents were doing for us, right? Our, our sons start to do the work on their own as far as what is good and what is not. And they begin to realize for the first time that there are other human beings in the world aside from themselves. And they finally realize that there are other people that they need to interact with. And because of that, now it's not only goods that exist, but there's duties. There are things that they owe other people. And so the conscience is ready at this point for, for true uh, formation that we're, that we're interested in. So how do we form them? I'm going to offer tonight five different means, five different ways that uh, we can help form our sons. The first is advanced cro coaching, direct advanced coaching. We're going to be tempted as parents and teachers to kind of just give them everything at the beginning, as much as we can, right? And I can, I can put this up on the board for my players, and I can give them all kinds of different situations that, that, I, that I think will come into play. Um, we'd like to give our sons a menu of natural law, right? This is, is all the good stuff. This is all the bad stuff. And it's funny, because a lot of my juniors will come into my moral theology class, and that's what they think they're about to learn. Um, they think that it's going to be this big, general presentation of things they should and shouldn't do from the beginning. Um, if we could do that, conscience would not be necessary. The reason we have a conscience is because of what we said before, that the, the, the scenarios are so vast and innumerable that the natural law, even, is not specific enough, cannot be specific enough, to cover all of those cases. And that's where the gift of our conscience comes in. When I, when I look at this play again, and I, and, I, and I ask my players what the right move is, they might you know, pick one of the two. And there's a reason for each of them. You can make a good case for each of them. Um, the answer is there's not enough information. Because What's the score? Are we up one or are we down one? If we're up one, then I'm going to be you know, more conservative. If we're down one, I want to be more uh, aggressive. It, it, what's this guy doing? Is he moving over? Is he going forward? There's, there's all these other variables at play. And so there's not enough information. Um, so we have to be careful with the general advanced coaching. We want, to, we want to get out in front and have this system and plan of, of moral teaching, and, and we have to be wary of it. Having said that, it's possible. Right? It is possible to teach principles. And I think at the younger the age, right, the, the more basic um, this can be and should be. Uh, Chesterton said it ought to be the oldest things that are taught to the youngest people. Right? When, they're, when they're young, and even before necessarily the, the age of reason, they can be taught general principles. Um, what we can take from the example of our Lord is that He will give us a, a rule that tends to encompass a lot. Um, you know, if you think of the Ten Commandments, or if you think of the Golden Rule, Right? This can, you can apply that to lots of different situations and figure out in that moment what could be helpful and what could be right or what could be wrong in that moral situation. Um, 
I guess what we can do as parents and what we can do as teachers is try to do that in, in, the, in the principles that we teach them. When we anticipate a scenario or when we anticipate a pattern for our sons and for our students, try to attach the what to the why. There's always a bigger why behind what we're asking them to do. Right? Don't, don't knock your brother over there because you know, he's smaller than you. And, and we want to be, we want to protect the, the, the weak. We want to protect the innocent. Um, we want to give them reasons so that they can start expanding their moral understanding uh, beyond just the, the, the minuscule what of what we're giving them um, in that moment. Um, but, but I think we should come to terms with the fact that this is insufficient. We're never going to be able to, to cover all those, all those cases that we, that we want to in this, in this type of way. What we need is prudence. And prudence is the virtue, uh, as Joseph Pieper says, it's the per perfected ability to make right decisions. Again, this is dealing with the particulars now. So moral act, when, when, and my, my juniors, again, will always want to say, well, is this a sin? Is this a sin? Is this wrong? Not enough information. Not enough information. You haven't given me enough information. And what we need to do is really help them with seeing that the particulars of the scenario of reality are very, very important. Peter goes further. He says that without prudence, there is no virtue. If you are not a prudent man, you cannot be a virtuous man. Because if you're just happening to do externally good things, but you didn't have the prudence to tell you that that is a good thing, go ahead and do it then it's not really a good act. It happens to be externally and superficially good, but it wasn't good, you know, you didn't get any merit for it. Um, and this starts to change our mindset a little bit on understanding about conscience, that it's not just right versus wrong. It's, okay, we actually want to see and infuse all our actions with goodness. We want to seek goodness. And that flies in the face of the contrary of the, of the, the, the common misconception, the cultural misconception of conscience, right? That it's just this guilt trip, you know? I didn't do that because of my Catholic guilt or, you know, whatever. There's that, um, you know, the, the great scene from, um, from the great philosophy show, The Simpsons, um, <laughs> where... Uh, Homer is, you know, one of his kids comes up and asks him, you know, Dad, I've got this problem. My, my conscience has really been bothering me. And Homer turns to him and says, oh, don't let that annoying thing boss you around. <laughs> now, this is, this, you know, that's kind of the cultural conception of what a conscience is. It's this drag. That's not what it is. It's this thing that actually frees us and attaches us to the good. But if direct advanced coaching is not going to be enough, and we, I think we can all accept that it's not, in order to learn about these particulars, we need our sons to experience these scenarios as much as possible. In order to do that, the experience is going to be a byproduct of freedom. So freedom is going to be the second mean, the second way that, that we will try to uh, pursue at the heights. The freedom is not just because we don't have enough guys to watch them, you know? The freedom is on purpose. That freedom exists out in the valley that they go out and play in this space because they need to be experiencing, and, and the recess, by the way, I'm convinced, is one of the most important parts of their day, when, especially when it comes to moral education, because they are experiencing over and over and over and over and over again, many times a day, some of those particulars, some of those scenarios. and. And we're not there to make the decisions for them. And they have to because, you know, their fort's at stake or, you know, they have to win whatever game they're playing. They have to make a decision in this moment. Um, so it's the freedom of, of space that we give them, right? It's the environment of freedom. But also it's the freedom to not step in too much. We need to repress our parental urge to intervene. And, um, and this is, you know, all of us say, well, all of us have that, I think, to greater or lesser degrees. We want to step in and 
be a good parent and teach them right now and right here what it is. When often what we need to do is just step back and watch and, and hold off. And it doesn't mean do nothing permanently. We might come back around to it. Um, but watch and just see. I remember being a, a new teacher uh, in the valley and, you know, the amount of times I was sitting, you know, drinking coffee with, with some of my colleagues and then seeing something kind of start to erupt and start walking. Like the veteran guys were still back here and I don't I need to do? And they were just watching. I said, well, okay, I'll just, I'll just watch it too. And sure enough, whatever was taking place got sorted out. Not perfectly always, and then you can come in and talk. But to give the, the time and the space for the boys, our sons, to make these decisions as much as possible is really what they need. You know, Maria Montessori said, you should never do anything for a child that the child can do himself. And we understand that, and we put that into practice maybe with, you know, doing the chores or doing some jobs. But the same exists in the moral life. The same exists in the moral life. We have to let them make some of these decisions themselves. You know, the, the, if, if any of you have children in youth soccer, um, yeah, I think I, I should go into business selling like earbuds or noise canceling um, headphones at youth soccer games because of the, the yelling of the parents on the sidelines is incredible. And the anger and the ire that's coming from the sidelines. But not just that, it's also verbal remote controlling, right? Go here, go there, go, look, pass, pass, pass. My favorite is kick it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, you know, that is really damaging. And by the way, we do it as coaches too. Um, but it's really damaging and it holds back the soccer development of that player because then he, it's not just that he feels he has to do it, but he's got in the back of his mind that voice, that nagging voice at every step. He can't, it's not just an external freedom, it's an internal freedom that we've robbed him of. And we do the same thing in the moral, the moral sphere when we intervene too quickly. So we just gotta, I think, fight that urge and, and tend to lay off a little bit more and maybe revisit. Um, okay, so St. Thomas, I, I, I'm going to try to not get too lost in the weeds of the terminology here of the, of, of the teachings on, on conscience, but I think this is important, this distinction that St. Thomas talks about in the moments of conscience. He talks about an antecedent conscience and a consequent conscience. It's not two different things. He's just talking about the timing of an act leading up to it. That's an antecedent conscience. We're, we're kind of mulling it over. We're deliberating whether this is good, whether this is right. And then the consequent conscience is afterwards. We're looking back on, on our act and, and judging it. Um, I, I bring it up because I think that when we intervene, right, the helicopter parenting in the moral universe, what we're trying to do or what we are doing, even though we're not trying to do it, is we're overriding the antecedent conscience. We're overriding that machine altogether such that we never give them a chance to actually give it a shot. And so, again, this space, this freedom is to give them a chance to flex their conscience muscles. Because if they don't, just like in the soccer world, if they haven't had enough of that experience, enough of that freedom, then those guys, when they get into a scenario that they're not used to, that they're not familiar with, they're going to freeze. And then they're going to go with whatever the strongest current is, whether it's their passion or their peer pressure, but it probably won't be their conscience. All right. So that's freedom. The, set, the third, um, we have to ad address the fact that when we leave boys in their freedom, then they're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. And potentially, if they're left in those mistakes for long enough, they can develop bad habits. And if they're left in those bad habits, they're, they'll start ignoring their conscience or actually stamping out their conscience. Um, it's good to reread re re with the boys every once in a while the, the real fairy tale of Pinocchio, um, which is a far, far cry from the, the Disney version, in which Pinocchio, when he... Uh, gets Geppetto arrested and flees from 
Geppetto, his maker, and is finally kind of on his own, he gets nagged by this conscience, this voice of this cricket on the wall. And instead of sort of befriending him the way that happens in the Disney version, he smashes him with a hammer <laughs> and kills him. And, um, and this is symbolic of the way that we try to justify our mistakes by just kind of numbing our conscience, just turning that volume down a little bit to the point where we can barely hear it, and it's not nagging us so much. Um, we need to correct. That's a reality. And um, our parent, when the boys mess up, we're going to have to step in and correct. So correction is the third means of teaching uh, conscience and forming our son's conscience. I will argue, though, that I think uh, this certainly goes for me, that we need to reevaluate our idea of correction. Correction should not be the most frequent way that we teach our children or that we teach our students. And it can sometimes tend to be, right? And so I think that just like we've got to bring our cars in for oil changes every once in a while, we've got to step back and look at the way we correct and reevaluate and see how we're doing it. St. Thomas, again, talking about the consequent conscience, he, he says that the main purpose of the consequent conscience, you know, this is after the fact, after the act, is not just to give the soul a feeling of guilt. Or, it's to serve as a teacher so that that person who acted can look back and say, that was good, good job. That made me feel good. Well, let's do more actions like that. Or that, did, that makes me not feel good. That must have been wrong. I did something bad there. But that's a really internal and personal conversation that goes on. Um, just in the way we don't want to override the antecedent conscience, we want to really respect the consequent conscience in our sons. And I think often how we go about correcting works against this in two ways. Number one, when we correct really harshly. Um, and, you know, the, the teachers and I, we, we talk about this uh, a, a lot. Um, I was, I was uh, the, the, the psalm, the responsorial psalm in Mass yesterday was, the mouth of the just murmurs wisdom. I think that's an interesting and I love that verb, murmurs wisdom. I, mean, I think sometimes we want to say the mouth of the just screams wisdom, <laughs> right? And, and that's what we're tempted to, to perform. And, and um, you know, the, the New Testament has lots of indirect parenting vice, advice, I would say. But there's only one, I think, I'll probably get corrected on this, but I think that there's only one clear, direct piece of parenting advice. It's, Fathers, do not provoke your sons to anger. And why? Why is that so important? Because when we correct harshly, we put them in a defensive stance. We tend to correct into a corner. It becomes this match, right, where we have to win it, and we have to corner them until there's no way out. Well, really what that does is it just flares their pride. It engages the pride of the boy, and... And the pri pride is going to keep the conscience from seeing clearly. Uh, Pieper again says a prerequisite for prudence is seeing with clear-eyed vision objective reality. And what do we do when we're feeling all proud is we're clouding reality to make it fit what we want it to be, to justify our actions. And so when we look back on how we acted, it's... It's, all, it's justifying, it's rationalizing, it's defending what we did rather than seeing it with clear-eyed objectivity. Um, sometimes just, just pointing out the mistake is all we need to do rather than using our anger as sort of one of the vehicles. Secondly, I think we do, justice, do injustice to it by um, our punishments. Now, I, I, I'm not going to say any blanket statements here. Punishments are not... You know, it's not like we should never punish. Our kids need to be punished every once in a while. But discipline means teaching. We tend to think of discipline as punishing. It, we need to um, allow our sons to have this internal conversation. What a punishment tends to do, 
and again, this is based off observations of, of the boys in the valley, it allows them to externalize the guilt onto whatever act you're making them do, right? Whether it's, um, you know, writing lines or, you know, they're grounded or whatever it is. They tend to just focus on that rather than on the internal dialogue that they need to have with their conscience about whatever it is, whatever act they, they did. St. John Henry Newman called the, our conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ in our soul. So even more original than, than the Pope, than the, than the vicar of Christ here on earth, is the aboriginal vicar of Christ inside of us. It shows, it shows to show just how important our conscience is, but also how personal and how, how internal it is. And it is impossible for us as, as teachers, as parents, to form it fully from the outside. It has to be an internal change that happens. Um, fourth is going to be culture. Uh, our boys are necessarily going to be influenced by the culture that they're in. I don't just mean the culture at large. I mean anything that they see, hear, anything that they experience vicariously, we're going we're gonna to say, is culture. Um, you know, with, with, my, with my soccer guys, you can play good soccer, you can experience good soccer. I can tell you all I know about soccer. You're going to learn a lot about soccer by watching good soccer. You're going you're gonna to learn a lot more probably than I can teach you. That might not be as effective because you might be lounging, you know, and not watching very carefully. But if you can see that that guy did something really interesting there, I've never seen that. And that worked out well for him. Um, it can be really effective, actually. And, and that happens with our sons. It happens in a number of ways. Four that I'll, I'll name here. First, in, in what they read. Okay? Um, we have a, it's one of our most important roles as teachers, but I'd also say as parents, to be guiding our sons in what they are reading. Uh, and it, it is a little bit on the dangerous side to just go out and let them read whatever. Because we want whatever they read to reaffirm the moral teaching that we're giving them in the home. And it's not that they can't read books that, you know, have terrible things happen in them or, or tragedy, but it's when those things are not clearly then shown to be wrong, right? And that good things are shown to be right. That makes, that's, that's the type of reading we want our sons to do. Um, but, but more than just keeping them away from the bad stuff, giving them images of what can be good. You know, an eight-year-old boy, some parents often ask me in the third grade, does he have any friends? I say, no, he doesn't have any friends, he's eight. He's got play pals. He's got companions. Friendship takes time, and it takes virtue. It does not happen at a young age. But we can really learn a lot about friendship, especially by watching people who are good friends or reading about people who are good friends. I think if, if, a, if an eight-year-old reads The Lord of the Rings and he sees how good a friend Sam is to Frodo, and what that actually means and what it looks like. And, and the way the story is told is so good that it's, he's actually feeling that deep in. That can go a long way. And it's going to go f a lot further than us telling us, telling him, this is what it means to be a good friend. Second, obviously, the, the same kind of goes for the entertainment media, the, TVs, uh, the TV shows, the, the movies, the video games that they're playing. It needs to back up what, what we're teaching at home. Um, I remember, you know, sitting and watching TV with my grandfather and him just kind of commenting there on, you know, the sports games and what, how the guys were acting. And, yeah, I feel like I'm, you, you learn from things like that. Um, I'm sure we either saw highlights or at least all, most of our sons saw the highlights of this awful fight that happened in the NFL with, this, uh, with, the, with the Browns and the Steelers a couple months ago where, when one guy took off the quarterback's helmet and hit him on the head with his own helmet. Now that doesn't interest me all that much, but what interests me about that scene is what Joe Buck, the commentator, said right after. And it sounds simple and it sounds common sense. He says, that is one of the worst things I've ever seen in professional sports. It's a simple thing, 
but I think it was huge because that's on the highlight reel and every boy around the world is watching that. He was looking up to these guys and here Joe Buck makes a moral value statement that is in line with natural law, clearly an obvious one, but you know, these guys look up to the professional players and whatever they do is gonna be good unless there's someone who, in a position of authority to say, no, that was not good. Um, thirdly, our peer group. Our peer group is going to, the boys' peer group, is going to be a huge impact um, in his culture on, 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 how he, on how his conscience forms. Um, we can just think of, of examples and in, in our own experiences of this from when we were uh, young and how our consciences were formed by those that we hung out with. Um, there's a, a story that I'll just share with you. It's very short um, about uh, Kyle McGinnis. And Kyle McGinnis is uh, an alum who passed away in 2003. Um, but he was a, just a, an extremely stand-up guy. And I remember one of his friends telling me this story where they were on a field trip and they were on a, on a bus, on a school bus. One of the guys got sick on the bus, right? Teachers and coaches, nightmare. He said, guys, get out, get out, go, go, go get, they were at a fast food place, go get your food. The teacher's kind of outside, figuring out what he's going to do. And, and it wasn't Kyle who got sick, it was somebody else. And even the guy who got sick kind of stumbled in and, and the restaurant to kind of clean himself up. And, and the other boy noticed that Kyle stayed behind and started cleaning up the mess. All right, and this is a high school kid. Now, what impact that can have on a bystander, right? If Kyle's in your peer group, and afterwards, by the way, he sat next to that boy and talked with him. What an impact that can have on, on a boy and on your conscience. Again, not just what right, what, what's right and what's wrong. What is good? This is good. Um, we don't have a huge amount to say there, but we can put them around good kids, whether it's a school or whether it's families that we hang out with. Um, being in close conversation with our sons about, about their peer group can be helpful. And then finally, in this, in this category of culture, role models, right? And, and no, you know, they're going to have the people that they see on TV, but, but no more important role models exist for our sons than ourselves. Um, regardless what they say or regardless even what they think, they will be saying, what would dad do? What would mom do here? And so we have to know them. We have to be prudent ourselves. Um, one just sort of concrete thing here that I think can be helpful and often very difficult is we need to apologize to our children when we mess up. We need to apologize to our students when we as teachers mess up. Because really in the grand scheme of things, they don't see us in a lot of moral action for the most part, right? Dad goes to work most of the time, the boys don't see him, and there's not a ton of moral choices that, that they witness us making, but they do in our personal interactions with them. And when we have overstepped or, you know, what, whatever it is, we don't have to apologize for every little thing, but um, that shows them, oh, okay, this, is, this, this clearly delineates something for me between, between right and wrong. Finally is the avenue of friendship. And I don't mean between the boy and his, and his peers. We already talked about that. This I mean between us and our sons. Um, I don't mean in a pally kind of peer way, right? They're not going to be our chums. It's going to be true friendship in an Aristotelian sense that we want the best for them, right? And we want and our love is allowing us to, to feel that. Uh, Joseph Pieper, again, I'm going to quote, says, a true friend can help to shape a friend's decision. He does so by virtue of that love, which makes the friend's problem his own. So we can't form a conscience from the outside. We really can't. Sorry, I, this was false advertising. <laughs> but we, we're very limited in, in how we can impose our conscience on our sons unless we approach our relationship with our sons in a dynamic of friendship. If our relationship is a true friendship, 
where, where we feel his hurt. We feel his joys. And so as parents, we're going to have to bypass a lot of the frustration, the stress, the you name it, the passions, and get down to the, the empathy and the love to, to show him. It's when we play with him, when we take him for a walk and talk to him, not in a condescending kind of way, not about something he's done wrong, just about life. Right? That's kind of what we try to do at the Heights with the mentoring program. It's not a disciplinary thing. It's not, hey, I got to talk to you about your bad grade. It's, hey, let's just talk. And let me, let me try to feel what you're going through. Let me see if I can kind of get in there and try to help you through that. It's not like we have to become psychoanalysts or psychologists with our sons, but it's just the, the, uh, the idea that they know that, that we want to be with them and that we want to help them. We, want, we take interest in their, in their joys and their sufferings. Because at the end of the day, you know, yeah, conscience belongs to the intellect. St. Thomas says it belongs to our practical intellect, of what to do here and now. But it's worthless without goodwill. So the decision takes place in the mind, in the intellect. And we, need you, we, we put our intelligence towards whatever decision that is. But we've got to want it. We've got to want it. Because, you know... This, in this scenario, I could explain to the guys, I could, or I could know, this maybe came from a real life, real game scenario, right? We're, we're protecting a lead. I want this guy coming back here and providing cover, right? He's got to be on his horse and get back here and provide cover. And he might have known that's what he was supposed to do and still didn't do it. So it's... It's not just, again, I guess I'm trying to expand this. It's more than just sort of knowing, but we also have to, the will and the intellect kind of work together here, that they have to want it, right? And and I know that that a player who has been working really hard for 80 minutes, if, if he's just out there to kind of show off for his buddies or to, you know, go out there and get his goals, He's not going to sprint 20 yards to, to, to provide cover. But if he knows that the coach loves him, man, he'll do anything for that coach. Or if he's playing for something bigger, his parents or something, he'll do anything. So at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's really not about just knowledge. But it's wanting to apply. It's wanting to, wanting to perform. So in closing, what, what does my soccer player need? Um, he, needs, he needs the chalk talks. He needs the prep, the, the general principles for me to give him at, at the beginning. The same way our sons need to hear, this is the basics of natural law. This is what you got to know. And the older they get, the more complicated it can be. Right? I wouldn't be explaining this to a bunch of, of six-year-old soccer players. The, the higher they get, the more intricate it can be. But I, I'll give you some, some general principles, and I'll try my best to be out in front of it. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to experience it. You, I'm going to have to give you the freedom to just go out and play. So a lot of times, we're just going to roll the ball out, and you just go play soccer. Same way we've got to put our boys in environments like the Valley, you know, or, or our neighborhood running around with their friends who you know, know the parents, and you know, give them that freedom and hold back and not overcoach and let them make some of these decisions. We're going to need to correct. If this guy doesn't come back here, I'm going to talk to him about it afterwards. I got to know why he didn't. If that was a clear decision that either I got to educate him so that he knows or I got to talk to him about it why if he knew and he still didn't. That's a problem. We got to get to the bottom of that. So our corrections have got to be they've got to be calm. They've got to be removed from the moment of anger. They have to be forward thinking. It's not just solving this problem. It's this problem, but it's looking at the next one too. How is me helping him with this problem going to help them make a good decision the next time down? If I'm screaming at him, it's not going to work. So I've got, got to keep that in mind. Um, I've got to I hope that he watches some good soccer. I've got to put him in go- good culture. Right? And as parents, that's, that's part of creating a, a family. 
and creating a home of what we, what we have there. And then finally, I got to be this kid's friend. Not in a way that I'm, I'm sort of tiptoeing around him or I'm ups, you know, I, I have to apologize to him just because he's upset about something. But I need him to know that I want his good. I want good to come from everything about him. And that he's not going to get that from me just saying yes to him all the time. But he knows I'm going to be there with him and that, and that I, will, I will love him. Um, because again, and this is maybe the, the, the biggest takeaway, is that, that this is not about just deciding between right or wrong, but it's helping our sons attach themselves through their conscience to the good. And if we can do that, then we can just sit back and we can let them follow St. Augustine's uh, advice, which is have love and do what you will. Thank you.